the recording started. So again, I want to thank everybody for uh, pre registering and for attending today's community webinar series on registration flow. And my name is Kent Gillum. I am the Senior Programs Manager here at BlackBot. I worked six years in, for DFW nonprofits in the area, everything from social service nonprofits to the SPC of Texas here in Dallas. I've been here at Convio slash BlackBot for almost six years now. November will make six years. Uh, I've spent a lot of my time here on the consulting team where I worked one-on-one -on -one with a lot of different organizations of all different sizes. And then I've been in this role for a couple of years now, uh, do, managing the webinars and uh, also the our, our community webinars and also managing the community. Uh, John Campbell's the guy who sends you the emails and tells you about all these things. I don't have an image and stuff for him, but he's the one in the chat room uh, looking for your comments and posts. Uh, so today's topics, we're going to take a peek at the free kit contents that we have for you. Um, this kit's Kit is just one piece of some different elements that we're going to add to it coming up over the next um, next few weeks or month. Uh, but this is just one element that we're going to get started with. I'll show you it. Also, we're going to look at the value of usable email. Um, all of this, there's been a ton of questions come into the community I've seen lately where people are are wanting to do they're wanting to do some purging and stuff. They're wanting to uh, the, to cut the dead weight emails and asking questions about how they do that and stuff. But we're not going to really talk too much about that. We're going to talk more about um, we're going to talk more about how to capture emails and how to capture as much data as possible. So hopefully those people won't become dead weight email addresses in, in your house file. Uh, also, we're going to talk about um, is that churn a smell? Are you really growing? Um, some people add hundreds, thousands of emails a month. Um, but then they lose half of that each month. So the growth really isn't just about how many emails you're adding. Uh, it's, it has that churn aspect into it. So we're going to take a look at that, and I'm going to give you some tips and some, uh, some tools to help you really determine if you're growing or not. And then we're going to talk about when capturing emails, think romance. It's not just a quick one date, uh, dinner date, and everything else. We really want to romance those people who come into the house file, so we're going to take a look at that, at that as well. So first off, we're going to take a look at the free kit. Uh, one of the things that everybody knows, uh, homepage real estate is, pr is prime real estate, um, which makes it really, really tough for anybody to want to dedicate a, a big block or a, any block at all to some kind of registration element. Um, Michigan Humane, I used to be their consultant, and they've had this kind of layout for a while now. Um, they've actually had that, that top element in their site for, for a long, long time. But what I want to focus on is where the big red arrow in the box is. This is part of the kit that we built for you. It's a, it's a series of uh, multiple panels and queries that will allow you to, to render a different panel and a different message based on a person's interaction or engagement level with your organization. For instance, this first one is really just one. Somebody comes in, they're either not registered on your site or they're not logged into your um, site at all. Um, so what happens, though, is once they do become registered, we don't want to just give them the same message again of, hey, sign up um, and waste that valuable space and, and just giving them a message that they've already responded to. So what this kit is going to enable you to do is be dynamic with your messaging. It's going to give you the opportunity to create multiple panels. For instance, this one is a panel for somebody who's logged in, visiting your website, but they're not a donor. It's a simple query that says this person's not a donor, so show them this panel. Um, the object of this is always to try to take the person, the, the constituent, to that next desired step, which in this case is, is a pretty simple one of becoming, going from a registered participant or registered constitu constituent to becoming a donor. Another panel that we have mixed in with this kit is one that simply thanks the person for becoming a donor. This one can vary. You can play around with this one however you want. Um, the, the default that we have it set up inside this kit is for this panel to show for 12 months after somebody gives gives the gift. So for 12 months, it basically has a query that builds on the, builds on the filter. Donated in the past 12 months, yes, put them in this group. If they're in this group, show them this panel on this homepage element. And so it pretty much thanks them for 12 months. Um, a lot of different organizations where I've built this for, they'll do something where they have um, a, tw a six month, a two month, you know, different variables where they thank the person for being a donor, and then they try to do this optional one, which isn't in the kit, but it's something that I think that most of you will be able to see how the kit is built 
and and add to it, you know, with whatever you panels you want to add to it. But basically, this optional one is help again. Once somebody has timed out from that one um, optional element of they donated, we thanked them for their donation. Time has gone by. Now let's ask them for help again. This panel will show up again. And so it's a really really easy kit. It's a really easy code to put together. Uh, don't you don't have to be uh, JavaScript savvy or CSS savvy or anything else like that. It's really just images, text, and some conditional code in there um, to help you get, get something like this up on your website. So what is a usable email worth? Um, some people will argue on different amounts, how much one's worth and how much, uh, how much one isn't worth. Um, I will kind of go on a tangent here real quick and just talking about house file building and and registration and things like that, a lot of people really just, it's, it's just not a hot topic. A lot of people don't pay attention to house file growth as being a hot topic. Whereas I myself, I like to think of it almost as, as almost important as fundraising itself. Because if you don't get email addresses into your, into your database, then you're not going to have anybody to ask money for or from. So house file growth is definitely one of those strategy elements that a lot of people overlook. They just don't pay attention to it. So I wanted to take a look at what a usable email is worth and hopefully kind of persuade you or, or, or convince you that household growth and paying attention to it is, is really important. So in the most recent online benchmark study that we put out this year, the median value of a usable email is $13. Now this varies from organization to organization by vertical, and, and I'll show you a, a screenshot of one of the images from that report here in a little bit that, that shows you um, all the different amounts. But pretty much the, the, the average amount is $13 per usable email. So if you think about it, if somebody has, if an organization has 20,000 usable emails, then that has a potential database value of $260,000. And so, you know, and I know that not every email is going to donate, not every email is going to generate $13 per email, but just the simple fact that you have value within those emails should, should kind of drive home the fact that you need to be trying to access and add as many emails as you possibly can. So really, you know, when we talk about the value of an email, I kind of figured that's really just basically it. If, if, if $13 an email doesn't seem valuable to you, then really can, I can just drop the mic and walk off the stage at this point. Um, there's, no more, there's no other way I can convince you how important house file growth is. So um, here's one of the screenshots from the benchmark study that shows the value. Um, I, I apologize for some of it being a little bit blurry and a little bit small here, but hopefully you can find your vertical and just see what your revenue per usable email address is. Um, what you'll see is there's a big discrepancy between different organizations. Um, I mean, you look at places, verticals like the nonprofit mailer where an email address, usable email address is valued at $2 a piece, public affairs $3 a piece. Um, food bank, though, obviously food bank has a big one there. $41 per usable email address is the value that they have there sitting in their house file. So, you know, it, let's just consider that. Let's consider the food bank vertical. Food bank A has a house file of 60,000 email addresses. And let's just say 2% of that house file donates the average revenue per email address. So 2% of that 60000 don't rate donates up to $41. That's $49,000 in the bank right there just from 2% of your house file. And so, you know, some organizations have higher than 2% response rate to their emails. Some folks wish they had 2% um, response rate uh, uh, with their emails. But that should just kind of give you a good idea on, on how valuable a usable email is. And like I said before, we know not every email address donates, but think of the impact if they, if they did. As you can see here on this slide, the food bank vertical, you know, here they were with the $41 value for each usable email, but their average fundraising revenue, online fundraising revenue, is, is at about $680,000, $685,000. If they were really up there where they want, you know, really – everybody was responding and stuff, you would look at a value more around the $2 million mark. Um, but of course, we know that's the big pie in the sky. That's what we're all shooting for is, is the big maximum return on a usable email. 
but just, that just hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of, of what the opportunity there is with each email that you capture. So when looking at a email file growth, you definitely need to know your starting point. Um, some of you have different uh, methods of, of seeing where your emails, you know, how your house file growth is going. Um, I know one of the biggest kind of obstacles is, is that within the Luminate Online tool, there's not a very specific, just a single report that says, this is the number of people we added, this is the number of people who hard bounce, soft bounce, unsubscribe. We had a net gain or a net loss of X number of emails over this past month. Um, I know that it's, it's just, unfortunately, it's just not that simple to pull it together. Now, there is a simple report just in the old report classic uh, reports where you can do an interaction timeline report under the analysis reports. And inside this report, you can go in on different interaction types. In this case, we're going to take a look at the registrations. And then you can do it by a certain time, date, frame, uh, date um, span, and also you can summarize it in different methods by day, month, or year. What this will give you is it will give you how many people registered on a specific day, or how many people registered on a very, very specific month. Um, so that, that tells you that you're at least adding new email addresses to your house file. Same thing goes for, or you can even look at it in the report results here. It'll show you day by day breakdown of how many email addresses you added. Um, one of the best things about this is you can actually see when your most popular days are. Is there something that correlates with a, a big spike in the, in the number of registrations that you got on a specific day? Or was there a very specific month where you do better that you should be focusing on trying to grow your house file? You can even do this report by the year if you don't want to look at each month and just kind of give a, get, take a good look at um, each monthly uh, amount or each yearly amount. And then also, or of course, there's always this popular go-to chart. I think uh, if you have the reporting pop chart set up on your admin homepage, then you've seen this. Um, it's an easy way to see that, that differential gap that's growing, uh, that often grows in between your total house file and your usable emails. Um, you can hover over this, you know, to see the little quick glimpse at how many usable emails you have. Um, if you don't have this quick report set up on your site admin homepage, or on some home page um, in your admin site, please post it inside the community and just say, hey, I'm looking at trying to set up these pop chart reports inside my admin home page, um, and, and I'll get that, and I will definitely jump in and help you out and then building out, a, uh, building out the reports admin home page. Um, but none of these, uh, you know, all the reports I just showed you, none of these really tell you how you're doing as far as house file growth. You know, because adding new emails does not mean you're growing. Um, you can add a thousand new emails in one month, which seems like a big success, but then on the opposite end that those reports that I just showed you, what they don't show you is that 600 people hard bounce or they unsubscribed. And we like that, we hate to refer to this, but um, you know, it's, it's that dreaded word churn. It's where people come in, their, their life cycle ends, uh, with your organization, they opt out, they unsubscribe, they soft bounce out, they, they just quit responding, they're no longer active. Um, so that churn is one of the biggest things that we have to, to pay attention to. What I did though for you is I did, I, I put together this little tool that's going to be in the kit along with this webinar and this is what I used when I was on your side of the, the, uh, the desk as, a, um, as an admin for the SPCA Texas. I basically built out this spreadsheet and just each month I would go in and take a look at the any registered user group, just go in, take a look at the group, manually rebuild it, watch it rebuild, and then I would just copy in the numbers across, the, across this little Excel sheet. This Excel sheet is, is already formulated for you, so the gray lines are all, already have the formulas and so it'll take the top two and it will tell you the difference, the percentage of growth or decline for each, each month. And so all you have to do is just start using this and just, just logging in once a month, knocking in six different, um, six different metric numbers, which are in that gray box in the group summary, and then the system will tell you everything, everything you need to know, whether you had positive growth, negative growth, if you had a big spike in hard bounces, if you had a, you know, what was your percentage of opt-outs, um, what's your percentage of valid emails, or what was your growth over the over the past year or whatever the time frame may be. 
So this is going to be in the kit that we have available um, for download. Um, some of you have trouble, I know I've seen this before, where some people just don't understand how to figure out their growth on their house file. Pretty simple um, kind of math. You just basically take the current number of your house file and subtract whatever the starting number was to find the difference in it. And then you take that difference number and just divide it by your starting number, and that will give you a percentage of growth. Um, in this sample data here that, that I have, uh, we showed that there's 128% growth. Now, when we look at growth, one of the things I definitely will tell you, I don't have a screenshot of it in here, but I will tell you to go look at that benchmark report and look at the growth for each vertical. We've been doing the benchmark report here at Convio or Blackbaud since Convio days, um, I think 2005, 2006, something like that. Um, and in each one of them, it will show a median growth rate for emails, what the median house file growth rate. And one of the things, if you've, if you've kept track of these reports each and every year, one of the things you'll notice is that number, for the most part across all organizations, kind of has been declining. Um, at one time when I was on the, at, at the Animal Welfare Group, uh, it, the, the growth rate was at about 36% a year was the, was, the gro was the average growth rate, email house file growth rate. Now it's at about 18%, I think. So it's almost cut in half in the amount of in the, in that growth rate, which just shows you how, how many organizations are out there now trying to capture email and how hard it is to capture email for people coming around. Uh, so back to the churn, uh, this word, so churn, when applied to a constituent base, this often refers to the proportion of constituents or, or subscribers who disconnect or leave during a given time period. Um, some of the different things that may cause this could be simply constituent dissatisfaction, maybe something popped up in the news that they didn't like, so they decided to unsubscribe, uh, maybe economic decline hit and they, uh, they just didn't, they felt guilty when you sent a, uh, an appeal for donations, so they, they just unsubscribed so they wouldn't see those anymore. Uh, maybe they just lost interest in your cause. They, they just don't have that passion for it anymore. Or maybe it's just a simple uh, process of their life cycle coming to an end. You know, so many constituents just simply grow tired of a specific cause or effort, or they only support a single effort of an organization. So they may only support your team raiser event, but they don't support anything else. And so they, they unsubscribe after that event. So those are some of the different things. So what causes email list churn? I think we all have seen these, these spoken to us before, written up and everything else about things we need to be paying attention to to try to keep churn at a minimum. Um, obviously one of, them, one of the biggest ones is relevance. Uh, if your email content doesn't meet expectations, if it doesn't match the, the interest that the person is, um, is interested in, if it doesn't look trustworthy, or if it doesn't come across as valuable to a person, they're gonna disconnect from listening to your email communication. Also frequency, some people email too much, some people don't email enough, and then some people have a big lag time between the time somebody registers to the time they get that first true personal communication from somebody. Um, which often, you know, when somebody registers on your site, that is the peak of their interest in your organization for the most part, and it starts declining after that. So you really have, you know, we've talked about this with our welcome series webinars, and I definitely recommend you go download the, the welcome series kit and watch that, watch that webinar and get a welcome series in place if you don't have that, because that alone will knock out this whole element of waiting too long after opt-in to communicate. Um, list quality is also another one. You get your email addresses from some sources such as um, co-registration. You may partner up with a, a local business. People come in, they provide their email address, that business gives it to you, you upload it into the system. People don't know why they're suddenly getting an email from you. Um, that, that's an off, often a, a big issue. Uh, email appends, this is one, of the, one big issue too. Some people like to go out. I actually had a client who spent 100 bucks to get 5,000 email addresses. Um, which was super, super cheap, almost too cheap. I didn't find out they did it until after it happened. They put it into their system, and almost every one of them either unsubscribed or hard bounced. Um, so definitely email the pins. Be very, very careful of them. Be, be very leery of anyone who promises you the moon with an email um, list. Event registration is also another one. Like I mentioned before, people register for your team raiser event. 
uh, your run walk event or maybe a gala or something like that, and after that's over, they don't want to hear from you again, and so they unsubscribe. And then there's those other non-organic methods where you're just uh, one of the biggest non-organic methods I've ever seen is board of directors going out, writing down everybody's email address that they know, and telling you to plug it into your database. You know, those are those are big pains because those people are typically uh, well-to-do in the community, well-connected, and just getting an email out of the blue like that just is is not a good thing. Um, and definitely the opt-in process. Uh, how you ask somebody to opt in, what information you're capturing, how much you're capturing, uh, how, I guess, intrusive, for lack of a better word, your opt-in process may be, those all, of, those all, um, all contribute to the, to the churn. Somebody may opt in to receiving an email from you or opt in to receiving email at all um, from your organization, but they got an icky feeling about it. And so from the get-go, there may be a bad taste in their mouth, which causes their life cycle to be very, very short. So uh, what is the common element that would help minimize churn because of all these re reasons, the relevancy, the frequency, list quality, and the opt-in process? It is more constituent profile data. Uh, the more profile data that you can gather on somebody, the more you can segment, the more you can personalize, the, the more you can get across your message in one message to one person instead of having to bring them along a whole story to get them to where you want to get them. So that's what we want to take a look at here today it, um, is take a look at that registration flow, that registration process, and give you some recommendations on ways to maximize the amount of data that you collect but not overdo it and scare people off. So if you would, I want to um, ask some questions real quick. Um, if you'll post it to all participants, if you'll post in the chat, I just want to know real quick what your feelings are on these. What is the maximum number of fields of data you should ask for on a registration form, or I guess your primary registration form? Ten, four, six. Five, two, six, three, all right, three, name is it. Okay, so the, so those are all good. You know, in, in every organization, I will tell you this, I'll, I'll kind of go off on this one, is every organization is different. Some organizations, they have a constituent base that is very willing to divulge as much information as possible. But then there's other organizations where it has got to be very concise, very to the point, the least the better, kind of like with the donation form, the least fields you've got to fill out, the, more, the less likely a bounce rate is to happen. So basically we want people to just get in the boat, right? We want them to just get into the boat, get into our database so then we can start talking to them and we can start cultivating them. So another question here, how many fields do you currently have on your primary registration form? It doesn't have to be exact. This is you can chime in in the chat, this is an example. So with Dale's one, three, three to four, one. Okay, so most of those, you know, most of those for the most part were actually seem to be less than, um, less than the number of uh, what people thought, you know, the maximum number were. So it looks like some, a lot of people are under their maximum number um, amount. So, you know, when I go to a registration uh, when I go to an organization site, I mentioned this before in webinars, I troll. I am a nonprofit organization website troll. I troll around all of your different organizations' websites, and I look at things from registration forms, the registration flow, welcome series, your donation, how's your homepage laid out. I look at all of these different elements and stuff. And, and sometimes I will go to a website or I'll go to an organization's website and I will see their, I'll, I'll click on that little button that says sign up for e-news or join our online community. And this, is, this picture right here is the way I feel when I see their form. Um, it is really just an, an overload of wanting way too much information way too fast. I'm just getting to know this organization, but they're wanting to know everything from my birth date to my kids' first, you know, my kids' names, the, the schools that my kids go to you know, everything about me and stuff. And I just feel really, really uncomfortable about divulging that much information right off the bat. Um, 
Yeah, so the, so that's one of the one of the big worries that I have about um, registration flow. So last question here. Other than email, what is the most important piece of data you collect? If you could chime that into the chat. Name, zip, name, zip, name, first name. Yeah, I figured we'd have name, zip, interest, credit card. <laughs> Um, name. All right. No, that's perfect. So thank you for chiming in. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that we take a look at when we do registration is we try to take a look at making it as optimized as possible. I know optimi optimize is like a is like an overused word here at BlackBot. We talk about optimize this, optimize donation forms, optimize registration forms, optimize web pages, optimize email. It's optimized to you know optimize everything. And so one of the things that we want to take a look at, though, we'd, we'd love to optimize, but we like to do it in a very strategic way. I'd like to go back to um, Michigan Humane's for this little slide here, my little re registration 101 refresher. You know, one of the things that I actually ha used to see a long time ago is I would see a big call for sign up for email. And, but you, you actually, you may not even believe me on this one, but as I've done some of my research and looked at different websites, I am starting to find it harder and harder and harder to find where it is that I can sign up to learn more about an organization, get on their email list, and, and start being communicated and cultivated. Um, Michigan Humane has had the same header since 2005 or 2006. It's worked great. Sign in, join today, write their email address, that's it. Um, in addition to that, we also built them that multi-panel that goes along with the kit and everything. But, like we mentioned before, that goes away and it has some other kind of messaging that goes along with it based on your interaction level. But still, they make email capture a priority. It's up high. It's very prominent. There is no mistake with Michigan Humane's website that they want to talk to you. They want you to join their online community, and they want to uh, start talking to you and sharing information about what they do. Here's one of the biggest things I'll say. If you don't promote registration on your home page of your website, then really you don't have any reason or, or, or wait to complain when people are not registering and joining your house file. Um, I would say, you know, above the fold, high as can be, very prominent, big button or a field. Either way, you can have a button that goes to a form or you can have an, a form itself right there on the home page. But whatever you do, just make it as prominent as can be. So that's 101. Another thing, let's call this 102, I guess, since it's a little bit more advanced, don't make registration just a part of your content. You look at a lot of different websites and you look at the content and there's a lot there on the home page. You know, there's a demand for home page real estate and, it, and everybody's competing for a piece of it. Your advocacy team wants a piece of it. Your e-commerce team wants a piece of it. Your, uh, your de development department wants a piece of it. Your uh, operations team wants a piece of it. I mean, everybody wants a piece of your home page. So for you to have a registration form mixed in there, sometimes it can just get lost. So definitely take advantage of things like a light box. We have a light box kit in the free kits page that you can go download, plug in a registration field in it, and really pop the uh, registration form out front and center when somebody comes to your website. The way this shadow box is built is somebody comes to your website one one time, and if they close it out without doing anything, it puts a cookie on their computer so it doesn't open up that light box again. And so you're not going to have to worry about it um, becoming overbearing, you know, like you're asking for their email every single time. But now if they go and delete their cookies or access from a different website or something like that or with a different browser, then, then it will pop up again. But definitely use a light box to make registration promotion front and center. Um, I did have um, light box. Uh, Sally, I'll jump on this one real quick. So we actually just unloaded it um, this last spring, so it works in CMS now too. So if you'll go in there and look at that kit, there's definitely a CMS, um, CMS component to it. Um, can you use a shadow box on a website that is not hosted by a Convio bike? Unfortunately, you can't, use, you can't use this shadow box because there's some S, uh, some S tags and different things like that that's brought into it. But there's some very, very simple ones that you can build. If you'll just Google Lightbox or Shadowbox, there's some very easy free ones that you can take and put it onto your website. 
and then you just take the code snippets that I'll, I'm going to talk about here in a little bit in the community thread. You can take those code snippets and go throw it in there and have a registration form on any website that you want with the shadow box. If we add a live box, will it pop up for anyone who's already registered? It will, you can set it up to where it will only pop up for people who come to your website who are not logged in. Um, or not or not seen as registered. That's that's one of the tricky parts is the system can't tell if they're registered or not unless they're logged in. Um, so I'll answer some more here in just a little bit. I want to kind of move along. Um, so one of the things that we talk about, I've talked about this since I became a uh, came on the con the consulting team back when we were Convio. I had no idea this was even a best practice. I had no idea this even existed as, as a strategy. And unfortunately, for the most part, I look around at different organizations, and if you did not have a consulting engagement with Convio or Blackbaud with one of our fine consultants, then usually this type of functionality or this flow isn't even put into place. So what we call this is just a phased, phased registration. And what this does is it allows you to capture more information while not overburdening the person filling out the forms making it seem like you're just trying to capture way too much information way too early in the relationship. So basically a phase registration happens like this. Um, somebody comes in, they fill out the little single capture email, that's it, they hit submit, and then once they hit submit, they go to a thank you page. That thank you page looks like a regular thank you page, but really what it is is it's another survey form. And so you have a thank you message at the top with some communication that says, hey, um, you know, help us communicate better to you by telling us more about yourself. It's a secondary survey form. A constituent's profile is, you know, is built through this form. It develops, um, it, it starts helping you develop that relationship. It helps you determine all those different things that you may need, like birth date, um, what their zip code is. So if you don't, if you don't want to pr ask for the zip code right off the bat on the home page, then let them just give you their email addresses, go to the next form, and then that's where you capture first name, last name, email, spout, or zip code, spouse's name. Um, the, the key thing to think about this, though, and I'll get into some more of it here in a little bit, is, is thinking about what applies to your organization. What is important to you? I, I tell people this all the time. If you don't plan on giving some, sending somebody a birthday card, if you don't plan on doing something with their birth date, if there's no value in knowing the demographics of their age, then don't ask for a birth date. Um, we know that the majority of donors within a house, within a household, are female. This, it's the women of the house um, who are mostly the donors. And how many women do you know that just do not like to give away their age? And so by asking for a birthday, you may actually be treading on some thin ice by, by trying to get them to, to divulge that kind of information. Another part of the phase registration, you know, you need to determine what information is required uh, of all registrants. Um, so you need to think across all your programs, all your giving program opportunities, all your volunteer pro program opportunities, any event opportunity that you have. Think about the information that you need to capture from a person that you can then use that information to communicate to somebody later on that says, hey, we noticed that you wanted to, you know, you were interested in volunteering at our organization. Here's some of the things that we have available. And so it, from right here, you're able to start communicating to them on a much more personal level. One of the things, though, that, that will happen, registration rate will fall as additional data is requested in the first ask. You know, I see, you know, like I asked a while ago, how many, what's the maximum number of fields? Um, some people did five, six, three, two, one. Um, I can tell you those groups probably that, that ask for six, seven, eight fields on the initial registration probably have a higher bounce rate than those people who just ask for email or just ask for zip code. And so that's definitely one of the things you want to think about. What can I ask in the very initial part, and then what can I do in a follow-up form immediately following that, just asking people to, to provide a little bit more info? Um, so like I mentioned earlier, once they complete the first form, the registrant is taken up to a follow-up survey. This is where things like first name, last name can be done, subscription preferences. Um, I know a lot of you, some of that was mentioned as, as key information you need to, you need to gather um, during, the during the registration. 
So subscription, you know, those interest opt-ins and stuff, those are key things that you should really be putting in the secondary form and not trying to push on to somebody or get them to respond to in that very, very first form. Um, this number has changed over the years. This has been a practice for a long time, but this number has changed. But, but really, we typically see about 45% of those people who register on your site go through and complete the second form and at least provide a majority of the, the data that you're requesting in it. Um, then, I'll, then, of course, you know that second form, the person registers, they're logged in, they provide their information in the second form, all of that stuff is updated um, and, and to the record and makes that record a more valuable record almost immediately. So one of the things that you should definitely look at, kind of like what I mentioned a while ago, at a minimum, capture data that will help you move a constituent to your, ne your next desired step. You know, a lot of the times we think of desired step as we want you to register, we want you to donate, we want you to come back and donate again, we want you to become a sustaining donor, we want you to become a major gift donor, we want you to attend an event, we want you to volunteer. You know, so the, there's all these different steps, and every organization has kind of their own different flow. I think pretty much we can all agree that the, the, the initial steps are register, donate. That's our first desired step we want, the first two desired steps we want people to do. But different organizations will vary after that. And so definitely take a look, like I mentioned earlier, what information can you capture in that follow-up form that is going to help you move somebody along to another desired step, whether it's to become a volunteer, um, whether it's to become an offline donor. Um, you know, we, we did that report a while back that talked about dual-channel donors and talking about the value of them and the lifetime value of a dual-channel donor, somebody who donates online and offline. Well, if you can get somebody to give you their mailing address, they have the potential to become a dual channel donor, and therefore their value is going to skyrocket, and their 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 tendency to donate more and to donate more frequently is higher when they're a dual channel donor. When you can communicate to them both online and offline, it's just a bigger bonus for you. So you obviously want to try to capture mailing information. Then, of course, there's all the other stuff. You know, do you want to, them to attend an event? Do you want them to volunteer? How do I get them to move to become a sustaining donor? Do you promote? Do you ask them a question? I'll, I'll go back to my animal welfare world and say, um, we have a, a foster program for pets. How do I move somebody to become a sustaining donor of that foster program? Uh, um, of that fo foster program, and that could be as simple as asking a question in that follow-up form that says. Have you ever fostered an animal? Yes or no? You know, if they have, then they are probably likely a, a good candidate to support a foster program that you have going on. Um, so one of the, one of the things also that we have going on now that we didn't have back when I was on your side of the table is utilizing things like a APIs. Um, I wish they had these back when I was uh, a side admin, but just kind of giving away my age and stuff, but we didn't have APIs back then. We didn't have the ability to build really cool, flexible um, panels, really cool, flexible forms within a single page element. Um, one of the pages, and San Diego Humane is going to love me for this. They're going to wonder why their traffic spiked, but I definitely recommend everyone go take a look at the San Diego Humane homepage and look at their Join Today website. Um, here's just a quick screenshot of it, but they have this simple Join Today Sign up to receive San Diego Humane Society and SPCA news and updates. And then you fill it out, and it simply just turns that panel. You don't go to a different page. You don't go to a different form. But you immediately just it, it just loads in a different form, that, a secondary form, that then they immediately capt capture things for, for interest. So they want to know if you're a cat owner, a dog owner, if you multi-species household. Um, if you have some other type of pet, like a rhinoceros, I guess, or something, um, are, are you a pet owner? Do you like small and furry owners like rabbits, hamsters, mice, etc.? And so then you can provide that information. By the time you're here, you're already registered in their site. You've already provided first name, last name, and email address, but now you're over here to the secondary form, and you're providing them some very, very valuable information. I will tell you from my days working in animal welfare, Cat people and dog people are as different as night and day, and you do not want to send 
a cat person, a heartstring tugging dog story appeal. They just won't respond to it as well as they would a cat story. So this is just a, a, a great example of utilizing space, but also taking advantage of the multi-form um, multi approach to registration. Um, so think long-term think long term registration. And I couldn't really find a graphic, so I just the never-ending data collection, because that's really what it is. Registration shouldn't be done after the first form is complete or the second form is complete. You know, there, there's no law, there's no best practice, there's nothing in the Blackboard Bible that says you have to stop trying to get registration information after X number of fields are complete or X number of forms are complete or X number of days have passed. You know, registration is really a lifetime event um, with, an org with a constituent. It can take you a month, quarter, year, or, or longer to, to finally get all of the information that you need um, from that constituent. And I, and I put in caps there, you. It's all about when you, the organization, have all the information that you want and need. So, you know, and as you grow as, you grow as an organization, your need for information may change. You may create a new program, so you need to go back and get more information. So never think that regis the registration process for a constituent is over. You should always be thinking about how to cultivate more information and capture more information. So the long-term registration flow, we've talked about this a little bit and just some of the step stuff. The following, this is just a basic example of a long-term registration strategy. First off, you have the simple registration form on your homepage. It contains one or all of the fields, first name, last name, email, zip code. Whatever you think is the most important without being too overreaching um, to get people to sign up, go with that. One of the things I will, will definitely recommend that you do is create a reusable page. Create, there's, a, there's a way that you can create two reusable pages in Page Builder. On one of them, you have a form that has first name, last name, email, zip. On another form, or on another page builder page, you just have email. And you can have that inside your page, wherever you want it, to where it will alternate. It will just randomly display one page or the other page, and, and so you can get a good test. And test and see just how much data collection on that initial form is too much information to be collected. I think once you find out which one performs the best, then go with that one and make that your primary form capturing information. Once that one is completed, um, they go to a thank you for registering page with a message of something like tell us more about you so we can tailor the information we delivered, um, followed by a second data form. This can be uh, where you capture things like first name, last name, full address, again, birth date. I always put a question mark about that because I've seen people collect it, but I've seen them never do anything with it as well. Um, are they married? You know, some missions. Um, maybe based on whether they have a, you know, if they have a partner, if they have a life partner, married, kids, you know, somebody else in the household, whatever it may be. Some other things to think about including is something mission specific. You know, ask the person, are they registered to vote? You know, that's an example. Are they a pet owner? Are they a breast cancer survivor? Things like that are very, very important to making sure that you can communicate to these people later on. And one of the things, too, that um, I want to briefly mention is, you don't have to go by interest for all of these. You don't have to use an interest. You don't have to build an interest and then make that as a, a checkbox inside the um, inside the tool itself or inside the form itself. You have 30 custom strings that you can use that you can build out and have it capture any kind of information you want. So if you want to have a, a simple question that says, are you a breast cancer survivor, yes or no, they answer that. It's put into a custom string and then that custom string information can either be queried to put them into a group for, for future segmentation communication, or you can actually take that content, whatever that content may have been, and actually populate it within uh, the, the text, uh, the copy of an email or the copy of a page if they're logged in. So um, definitely think about doing things where you can catch, uh, capture information that's very specific to your mission. And then, of course, there's always the interest ones, you know, email. Which email subscription should I, you know, do you want to subscribe to? I, I was a consultant for one organization. Um, I think they had 15 different e-news type communication pieces going out every single month, and so the, the, it was it was critical for them to ask the person, "What are you interested in hearing from us about?" Because if not, they were going to probably get 15 different emails a month, e-news a month, 
Um, and we all know what that does with list fatigue and making people check out really quick. Also, you know, volunteers and definitely interests about affiliations. Um, ask them if they're, you know, affiliations like are they a board member with another organization? Have they ever thought about being on the board? Have they ever volunteered somewhere, done something else? You know, just any other way that you can tie into your organization. Um, continue on the long-term registration flow. You know, those two that we just went over, those are day one. Those are the, they signed up, they, we were told them thank you, asked them for some additional information. Now we're thinking on down the road. This can be the next day, the next week, the next month or whatever, but don't, but don't stop. Don't stop trying to cultivate information. Things like a simple survey. You can just send out a simple survey to somebody that says, do you believe in X or Y? That information may be the thing that makes you send them an email next month or not send them an email next month. Um, also doing post-action or donation follow-up. Um, things like, what do you love the most about our mission? You know, save lives by providing mobile exams, meets a critical need in my community. That kind of information can tie into a, a very specific appeal that you may be doing end of year. Um, let's say that they, they provided information saying they – um, like the fact that your organization provides mobile exams. Well, we're just so happened putting together a, the copy and the, the graphics for an end of year campaign that is about our mobile exams program. And so you know that that person will be moved more by that piece than they would the other piece talking about an after school program that you may have. Um, also, think about opportunities you have within every communication to a constituent to get them to provide valuable data. Um, and also, this is one of those ones that's tedious, it's monotonous, it's something that as a site admin you just loathe doing, but I can't recommend enough do, building out queries on those fields of data that you want filled, but, but they're not filled by constituents. Again, birth date. Let's say that you absolutely need the birth date of all your people. You have a birthday card program where you send people birthday cards all the time, so you need birth date. So you can create a query that simply says their birth date field, show me everybody whose birth date field is, is, not, is blank. And so it puts everybody into a group. Then you can take that group and target them and ask them for their birth date, um, explain why, and then thank them for you know, providing that information. Same thing for zip code, especially if you do any kind of advocacy work, um, action alerts or anything like that, you have to have a zip code. It's just going to make it easier for the person for, to, to easily – take action when you when you request that of them if they don't if you don't have a zip code or a mailing address to go along with it it's just going to make it very tedious for them so you can so you can communicate to everybody who you don't have a zip code explain to them the benefit of you having a zip code on file so you can talk to them and then of course first name first name last name um, I will tell you I've gotten to a point now in my life where if I get an email from somebody that says hey uh, dear friend of the organization or something like that I don't even I don't even really read any further than that. It's, it's gotten to a point where if somebody doesn't know my first name by now, um, if they've never asked me to provide it, um, then, then I really don't feel like they know me, and therefore I probably may not even know the organization really, and so I don't support them. So I know a lot of you posted in the chat talking about, you know, very important to capture the first name. I would say first name is right up there. First name, I, wouldn't even, I don't even think last name. I would say first name, email, zip code. If you're going to look at three fields, those are the three fields that I would look at. Um, provide registration opportunities everywhere. Um, like the question earlier was talking about putting a light, uh, putting a light box on, on a non-convio page. Um, you, can do, you can't do a light box, but you can do a registration form. We have um, – right, let me back up. We have all the kits, all the code snippets that you could ever need to present as many – fields as you want to, to put on a local business's website, a church's website, uh, a, a community board page, a blog, all those different things. We have everything that you need. Just go to the free kits page and look at the code snippets. Or if you just go search snippets, S-N-I-P-P-E-T-S, -P -P -E in the community, you'll see actually where I did a post in the Illuminate Online board um, that lists about three or four different code snippets for registration elements. All you have to do is create a, a ghost um, survey to go along with it, change the ID, take the code, and post it wherever you want. 
Um, one of the reasons, though, why you should really start looking at capturing emails everywhere else or other places like Facebook and all those other different places is really kind of driven from this fact, which was noted in the most recent benchmark study, and that is website traffic across all verticals, basically, except for Canadian organizations, is down. And not just down a little. I mean, for the most part, it's down um, a significant amount. I mean, if you look at higher ed, website traffic is down 39% from the previous year. Um, hospital foundations, 36%. Hospitals, 34%. Um, let's see. I'm trying to read here upside down a little bit. But you can just see website traffic is down across the board. And so you can no longer just, just expect that website traffic is going to be your source of new email capturing, new site registrations, things like that. So don't don't just use house file, um, don't just use the house file, or your home page as your only source for capturing emails. Um, so be aggressive with registration efforts. Definitely, uh, I've mentioned some of these a while ago. Add registration links or a form itself uh, on local business sites, mission communities, board of director members' websites. Your board of directors are supposed to love you. They should be putting up a, a site registration form or link wherever they can. If they don't do it, then I don't know who else will. They're, they're supposed to be your biggest evangelist. Uh, also do things on any social site, Facebook, Yelp, LinkedIn, any kind of blog that you can get it on. Um, and then change it up. Use a light box, like I mentioned before, to kind of change up the registration element. Create a dedicated banner promoting registration. If you see the banner that, that's on the CCC homepage or on the community, that one that rotates, if you have one on your site, use that real estate to call out a reason, call out, um, call out um, the registration request. And then that kind of leads me into this next one. Um, don't just promote or offer e-news. I know at one time that used to be the big thing. That used to be the hook. Sign up and get our e-news. But you and I know now that another email in our inbox is just not something that we're looking forward to. There's got to be something more to the request than just you're going to send me another email if I sign up. Um, you know, give them something they want. Um, talk about event opportunities, being the first to be invited to an event. Tell them they're going to get um, behind-the-scenes access to something. Tell them they're going to be the first one to know something. Tell you know. Do something besides just e-news. I think we kind of outgrew the, the e-news part. Yeah, it's important. Um, you want to know, you want to tell them that they'll get monthly communication from you about the organization and the things you're doing, but it, it really needs to be more now. You're battling with so many different organizations for that one person to give you their email address. You better step it up and make sure that what you deliver to them is more valuable than what that other person is going to be delivering to them. Um, and even then, they, if they do give you their email address, they're not going to just keep opening up an email. Um, they, they, they're going to want to have some more value to it than that. Um, last one here is disguise the sign-up in the form of a simple questionnaire or other form with an opt-in element at the end. Um, when I say disguise, I don't mean to be deceiving and you know, add somebody to your house file and, and then email them without them knowing they signed up. I'm talking about creating a survey form, a questionnaire that says, do you believe in X or Y, or did X or Y impact your life? They answer it, and then the, at the, when they go to answer it, then the very bottom piece would be, hey, thanks for responding. Would you like to find out the results of this? We'll be happy to email them to you. Just simply opt in to receiving an email, and we'll send it to you. So don't think that a registration form has to be a quote-unquote registration form with first name, last name, email, zip in it. It can be a simple question with an email field, submit, and that's it. Another thing to do is to think outside the box when thinking about your registration block. Don't think that you have to have it say submit. Um, you know, make it really cool if you have to. If you're a cool organization with a cool constituent base, a young hip constituent base, make it something that's really going to float their boat. Make it say something like, you know, hit us up. You know, tell me what, tell us what's happening. It's just something else besides submit. Um, also, think outside of just calling it sign up for e-news, like I mentioned before. Um, I, I see a lot of organizations now going with join our online community. Um, that seems to be a lot, a lot more, I like that, obviously, since I'm a community manager. I like join our community much better than 
sign up for our e-news. But whatever you do, don't just put out the standard old register now, we're going to talk to you message. Um, be really creative with it. Whew. And so with three minutes remaining, um, <laughs> sorry if some of that was a little fast. Um, if you have questions about this webinar at all, here I'm going to post this over here into the chat window really quick. Here is um, the forum where you can go ask questions about this. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to t t take a look at the light box or any other free kit, there's a link to our free kits page. If you, this recording and other recordings are here on our community webinars page. And then if you are interested in looking up for the, looking at the benchmark report, um, which by the way, if you, if you want to take a glance at it, I do have some of the slides here that just kind of shows you some of the elements. I just added some additional information slides. Um, but if you want to download the uh, benchmark report, uh, there's a link for that as well, so you can go um, access that. And I think that's really all the all the links I had. Um, again, this recording will be will email all of you. Um, if you register for this webinar, we will email you, um, thanking you for attending, with a link to everything, a link to the webinar, to the kit, to the slides, and everything else. Um, definitely, if you have any questions about building out a really nice. Um, unique registration form on your home page or a follow-up form, definitely post in this community thread and I will be there to help you out all along the way. I have all kinds of code snippets and samples that I can share that I just didn't have time to get to on this, um, but I would definitely, um, but I, I definitely would, um, uh, will help you out with that. So um, John, did you record any questions um, that maybe I need to address really quick? Uh, you have to hit star. Oh, John's listening through his computer. I'm so sorry. Um, so let me just float through here. If you have, let's see, um, light box. How often do? What? Okay, so John, uh, if you're still on here, John Messino asks, how often do you recommend keeping the light box active on your home page? Um, I would say like a, a two month or a three month span. Maybe one quarter would be a good time frame. Um, this one organization where I first found out the power of a light box. They were getting 90 emails a month, 90 new emails a month before they installed their light box. Um, within three months of having their light box up, they, they, they captured over 2,000 email addresses. And that was during the summer months. That ran from May to the end of July. And so don't keep it up all the time. I definitely say shake it up. Um, but once you build the light box for registration, uh, you have the code and everything in there, then you can go in and change it for other stuff. Instead of promoting registration, promote an event you have coming up, promote a campaign, promote a program that you have launching or something like that. So um, just because, so you don't necessarily have to take the light box down altogether, but just change up what the content is within the light box. Um, does it allow people to give date of birth without year? You know what? I don't think that you can give date of birth without a year, but you can, uh, Dale, this is to you, um, you can do a custom string where you just capture month in, month in uh, or just month. If you just want to capture the month and say, tell us what month your birthday is in, May, and, or whatever, then you can capture that in a custom string and use that to query on. Uh, Philip asks, I thought you had to have first name, last name, email to create a Convio constituent record. Uh, no, all you need is just email address. Um, Philip, that's all you need to create a record within um, Constituent 360. Um, let's see. So the the online sign-up is different. It only requires email. What happens when you are in the back end and edit a record and it requires first name, last name before you can save? You won't know it. Um, the, I don't know of any time when I've ever opened up a record when it only had the email address and, I, and it didn't let me save. I'll have to check into that one for you, Philip. Um, let's see. Sorry about this. I'm trying to make it through here. All right. So does anybody else have any questions? Thank you definitely for all of the, the kudos for the webinar. I'm so happy it went well with no um, – with no uh, – audio issues or anything else like that. Um, so if you have any other questions, again, go to this link. 
Um, I hope you went there really quick and saved it, um, but you'll be getting an email very soon with a link to that as well. So, again, thank you all for attending, and I hope you look forward to joining us next month when we are going to talk about – oh, my goodness, I just lost it. Um, we're, we're talking about Team Razor virtual events coming up very soon, so definitely check out the community webinars page, and we'll have registration up for that pretty soon. So thank you all again for coming. See you next month.